there again. This is Bet Barnes and uh, Jim Stebbin coming at you with the world famous Cotton Companion here this second week of April 2019. And whether you are joining us from Lubbock or from Leland or any other cotton town out there, we want to welcome you back. Uh, I, as always, am joined today by my partner in crime, Cotton Growers Senior Editor. Mr. Jim Stebman, howdy, Jim. Hello, Beck, and hello, everybody listening to us today. There we go. And, uh, you know, before we get started here, we want to bring you a quick word from our sponsors in List. This episode of Cotton Companion is brought to you by the Enlist Weed Control System, ready to help you control tough weeds with 2,4-D choline featuring inherent low volatility. So, all right, we know it's warming up out there uh, when it's not pouring down as it is here in Memphis today and has been for a couple days now. Uh, we know that y'all are likely raring to get started out there, and, uh, at, you know, that's understandable. We, we also know that today as we record, it's a big day for a large, kind of specific, but uh, uh, large nonetheless, portion of our audience, and those are the, that's those of y'all who are out there in Lubbock uh, as the Red Raiders are gearing up to go to the NCAA basketball tournament, March Madness, the final game is tonight, and so uh, we want to wish them good luck. By the time y'all hear this, that game will be old news, and y'all will either be elated still or dejected still, but we just want you to remember when you hear this that we were wishing you well. Uh, in the run-up to that thing. Also, if the, I can't imagine there are, but if there are a handful of you Virginia Cavaliers out there, well, we wish you good luck too. But there's not there's not as many of y'all as uh, there are of the of your opponent tonight. So it's guns up here in Memphis. I hate to do that, but and uh, and, and real quick, we of course we can't. We would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the uh, Bailey Lady Baylor Lady Bears who won the NCAA Women's Championship also from the great state of Texas. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that. We would hear, no doubt, from uh, the handful of Baylor Bear supporters we've got. Who Absolutely. Listen to those things, so, so. I mean, the one thing we can be delighted about is that we've had great representation in the tournament from all of the states, the cotton states. It's a cotton belt takeover. Cotton belt Absolutely. takeover March Madness this year. So uh, we don't want to linger too long there. we got a great <clears throat> episode for y'all today, and we're doing things a little bit differently. We're going to bring you uh, everything as normal. We're going to bring you, Jim's going to lead you on a discussion of the news as always. going to be a little streamlined as you may recognize this introduction has been a little streamlined because uh, we're introducing a new segment that we're trying to make time for uh, and that is going to be an agronomically fo focused segment. We know it's the time of year where some of y'all are starting to get back out there in the field so we want to take advantage of this platform uh, and its timeliness to discuss uh, in field situations, agronomic situations with y'all in each episode. So we're kind of carving out a little space in today's episode and in each episode going forward to do that. Today, we're specifically going to be talking about uh, crop protection considerations. We got three tips, best management practice tips, as we call them, uh, for y'all to be to be thinking about uh, as you get as you get out there in probably soggy, wet fields. And that's kind of the idea, what this wet spring means for your crop protection consideration. So uh, we'll burn that bridge when we get there. After that, we're going to bring you all the final installment of the speech that Joe Nicosia gave at the Mid-South Farm and Gin Show. Uh, that will be our Market Minute segment. And then finally, for our One Big Thing segment, our last feature segment of each episode, we're going to be talking acreage and particularly the USDA Planting Intentions Report that was released last week. USDA is planting intentions, right? Prospective planting. Prospective planting. So does NCC call it planting intentions? Yes. Okay, that's where I get them mixed up. Each of the. I'm just glad we're through with all of the uh, all of these surveys. Yeah, right. Yeah, each of the surveys has their own little uh, <laughs> phrasing for what they're talking about, which is acreage. So, uh, the USDA came out with theirs uh, was released last week, I believe. And so we're going to talk about the number that they are projecting and what it says about Cotton's prospects uh, for 2019. So, great episode today, packed full with stuff that I think y'all will be wanting to listen to. And so, uh, without any further ado, I will turn it over to Jim here, who's going to lead us in a focused discussion of the news items of the day. Go ahead, Jim. Absolutely. And just to, <clears throat> excuse me, just to follow up with Beck on on what he said about the USDA planting intentions, uh, that acreage estimate. Uh, 
basically the, the cotton acreage estimate season finally ended uh, March 29th when USDA released that prospective plantings report. Uh, their numbers project all U.S. cotton acres to total 13.8 million acres, which is down 2% from 2018. Uh, if you look at it by, by type of cotton, upland cotton area is estimated at 13.5 million acres, which is down 2%. And the Pima ELS acres are estimated to climb 2% to roughly 255,000 acres this year. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that because we will come back to it. Uh, it's needless to say, this, this report kind of caught the market off guard, uh, it was, uh, which was also good for prices uh, in the days after uh, the report uh, came out. And like Beck says, we're going to get into more details on this later in the, uh, in the podcast when we get to our one big thing. Uh, next item is uh, talking about, uh, according to information from Auburn University and the University of Georgia, Extension plant pathologists and crop specialists have confirmed the presence of cotton leaf roll dwarf virus or cotton blue disease in four southeastern Alabama counties and 14 Georgia counties. Basically, this is a problem they started seeing last, last fall. Uh, it is overwintered and uh, we'll, they're keeping an eye on it, obviously, for, for 2019. The disease is spread by aphids. And then likely overwintered uh, as a using henbit, uh, one of the common winter weeds, as a host. Symptoms of the disease include leaf curling, reddening and drooping of leaves, distortion of leaf growth, and shortening of the upper internodes, among other things. So it's uh, it's safe to say that the uh, the extension professionals in both of, in both Alabama and Georgia are working together to put some guidelines and recommendations together to help manage this disease as spring planting for cotton uh, gets closer and closer in these two southeastern states. Next item, uh, Tennessee Department of Agriculture and the EPA have approved a Section 18 label request for use of Transform WG in cotton for control of plant bugs in 2019 uh, in the state of Tennessee. This label is effective June 1st and expires on September 30th. And a copy of the label, which you can find online and in a link on the cotton grower website must be in the possession of the user at the time of application. So uh, good news in terms of plant bug control, but let's make sure you get the proper documentation when you go out to the field. Uh, next, we're happy to announce that, uh, that our good friend, uh, Dr. Stanley Culpepper, who's University of Georgia Extension Weed Specialist, has been awarded the 2019 Walter Bernard Hill Fellow Award for Distinguished Achievement in Public Service and Outreach by the University of Georgia. He was one of eight University of Georgia faculty and staff recently honored for their service to the state. And finally, something else to put on your calendars, folks, uh, especially those of you out in the High Plains, the annual Celebrate Cotton Football Game uh, is now officially set for September 7th in Lubbock when Texas Tech takes on University of Texas El Paso, affectionately known as UTEP. Very cool. That's also awesome. uh, always rather a great uh, game, a great day that they put on out there in Lubbock. The support that that university and that community shows for our industry is uh, is great. It's, it's good to see it. It warms the heart uh, of those of us here in the Mid South. So. Absolutely. So all right, Jim. I uh, assuming that's it for you. That's it. Uh, thank you. As a uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are trying to carve out a little time in each episode to talk about what actually goes on in the field out there. And so we'll do that now. Uh, we wanted to take advantage, again, as I said, of this platform that we have. With the magazine, we hit y'all once a month, and you know we're not always, uh, from a time perspective, able to discuss sort of late-breaking stuff that's actually happening out there in the field in that format. But uh, on this podcast, we can. You know, Within two-week intervals, we, we can kind of be up to date on what's going on out there. And we know... The thing that's on y'all's mind at this moment, at least those of y'all here in the Mid-South and likely in the Southeast too, is that it's been wet, man. It's been a wet and mild spring and that those conditions just generally uh, pose different problems for you as you are thinking about crop protection, starting clean, getting a healthy stand out there. And so we wanted to bring you uh, best management practices, best management tips on three different crop protection fronts as you head out there this year. The first is weed management. By the way, I'm pulling these tips from a great story that my partner in crime here wrote in the April, April issue, which should be hitting y'all's mailbox any moment now. 
uh, any day now, I should say. So uh, be sure and check that out. If you're a magazine subscriber, you will find that story in the April issue. But three quick takeaways from that thing I will summarize for you here. The first, weed management in light of this spring that we've had. Uh, you are probably seeing a lot of growth here recently out there in your fields. If your fields look like my backyard, God help you if they do. Uh, as temps warm up and there's a bunch of water, you know, coming in, uh, you're going to see a lot of, you guys are starting to see this growth out there most likely. So uh, don't be too quick to pull the trigger on those first herbicide applications. Uh, I know that y'all you're thinking about ground temps when it comes to planting, but we, we want you to be thinking about those ground temps when it comes to burn down as well. Uh, per uh, Matthew Wiggins, who is a technical service manager for FMC, who Jim talked to for that April issue story, he says, for burn down, if it's cool and wet, weeds aren't actively growing. And if they're not actively growing, then we can't actively kill them. So a burn down application that's too early uh, when conditions are cool and wet is an ineffective burn down application. So the first tip here, you want to wait until your soil temperatures are between 40 and 45 degrees before you pull the trigger on that burn down application. Keep that in mind this spring. Second, second tip here, uh, it, because of this mild spring uh, that we've seen, it's, that means good things for insects that are a little farther north in the cotton belt as these host plants start, start to green up as things warm up. So uh, Mid-South entomologists, they're already expecting a big year for uh, plant, uh, excuse me, red banded stink bugs. My brain was thinking plant bugs. Uh, already expecting a big year for red banded stink bugs, for example. So tip number two, plan and budget accordingly. If you're planting into a green cover crop, a pyrethroid or an in application may be necessary for good control. So third, third, uh, crop protection topic. We've hit weeds, we've hit uh, bugs. Now, obviously, we want to talk about disease control. So main, this is a really general tip here, but these cool and wet conditions are a recipe for disaster from root rot and, early, and other early seedling diseases. So as the temperatures warm up, the risk from those soil-borne diseases is reduced a little, but even still, here's the big takeaway, tip number three, this is not the year to skimp on fungicides. Uh, and uh, seed treatments are going to be even more important than ever this year. So just have a mind for that. This is going to be difficult year uh, uh, on that front if you don't get a, get a handle on it early on. So, uh, Jim, did you have anything to add to, no, this, I think to the ground yeah, story that you wrote? No, I, and I think the tips are, are valid, particularly in a, in a spring. And I noticed, you know, obviously with corn planting going on right now, uh, a lot of growers have been out trying to clean up and fix fields from, from all of the ruts and damage that were done back during a, a pretty wet harvest as well. Yeah. So uh, these are things, obviously, to keep in, in mind as you're getting out and reworking fields and getting those ready for, uh, for planting. Uh, I was driving through the Mid-South this weekend and noticed a number of fields where, you know, burden out applications had been applied. Uh, so I know folks are out and, and trying to get things going, but, you know, for temperatures around here have been, I guess, warm enough for the last couple weeks but you know again just uh keep an eye on uh, on the temperature gauge and uh and, and get things done on a timely basis it's going to be an interesting year in terms of getting everything in on time yeah yeah it sure is it's starting off on a kind of squirrely foot here yes with this spring so all right we we want to pause there uh to bring you, as we always do, a message from our sponsor this week in List, uh, our custom content editor, Robin Sickberg, had the chance recently to sit down with Shauna Hubbard, who is a herbicides product manager at Corteva AgriSciences. And so we're happy to hear from those two right now. Hello, I'm Robin Sittberg, custom content editor at Meister Media Worldwide, publisher of Cotton Grower Magazine. And I'm here with Shauna Hubbard, Enlist herbicide manager. And we're just going to talk a little bit about the um, Enlist trait in cotton and in soybeans. And welcome to the program, Shauna. Thanks, Robin. Tell me uh, what the Enlist soybeans are and what's the outlook in 2019. Enlist E3 soybeans are a new technology from Corteva AgriScience. We're going to be launching in 2019. And E3 soybeans bring uh, an exciting new weed control opportunity for growers. The three stands for three tolerances to 240 choline in, in Enlist herbicides, glyphosate and glufosinate, 
uh, really excited to be bringing this technology forward to farmers this year. Uh, we are driving toward 10% market share in the 2020 season. So lots of activities here in 2019 as far as commercial launch and production ramp up of E3 beans, as well as continuing education initiatives around the system. Well, it sounds like the program's going strong then. Um, so let's go back to cotton. What are you seeing with the enlist trade in cotton? For Enlist Cotton, we had a really strong year. Uh, last season, we sprayed about 1.5 million acres of Enlist Cotton with Enlist herbicides, which tells us uh, that the weed control flexibility of that system and the characteristics of the, characteristics of the herbicides are really working for farmers. Enlist Cotton is available exclusively from the Phytogen brand, and they've continued to expand their portfolio of varieties uh, again, really giving farmers options for post-emergent weed control since that Enlist cotton is tolerant to 2,4-D choline in Enlist herbicides, glyphosate, and glufosinate. So it's all about designing a program approach to control tough weeds. Okay. Well, that's excellent. Um, sounds like and it's going to be a, a re really good season for um, farmers growing, uh, coming up with um, some new products to work with. So where can farmers get more information on Enlist Cotton, Enlist E3 Soybeans, and the Enlist Weed Control System? The best place to go for more information on Enlist is Enlist.com. You can find herbicide labels, a training module, and additional info on incorporating both the trait and herbicide into your operation there. Okay, well, we've got to wrap up. So thank you so much, Shauna, for being on the program. Thanks for having me, Robin. All right, very good. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Shauna Hubbard, for that. So uh, now we're going to keep things going here. We're going to switch from one interview to another. Uh, this one as part of our Market Minutes, weekly Market Minutes segment. And uh, this week's Market Minute one features the most, uh, the most qualified expert, uh, as Dr. L.A. Cleveland called him, and that's Mr. Joe Nicosia of Louis Dreyfus Commodities. And this is our, if y'all been listening the past few episodes, We've brought you different installments from Joe's speech at the Mid-South Farm and Gin Show. And uh, this is going to be our final installment of that. Uh, this is the last bit of Joe's speech that he delivered to a kind of a packed crowd there in Memphis almost a month ago now. And uh, it was a wide-ranging speech. He touched on a lot of things. If y'all have ever had the opportunity to listen to Joe and the economic update that he delivers at the Mid-South Farm and Gin Show, it, it's great. And you walk out of there feeling much more knowledgeable uh, than you otherwise would be, even if you're a slow thinker like myself, <laughs> you come out of there feeling really sharp. Uh, so whenever he speaks, we take notice. And so this is the last little snippet of that speech. It was very wide ranging. It was sprawling. And so we're bringing them to you, bringing you installments of these things that are a little more easily digestible. Jim, uh, what is today's installment? What was it? What was he hitting on in this piece? Well, I think, uh, again, he's talking a little bit about the trade war situation between the U.S. and China. And even though this presentation was recorded in, in roughly a month ago at this point, uh, we're still obviously waiting for a deal to end that trade war. And it's, uh, it's a deal that President Trump recently noted isn't quite ready yet, but that a very monumental, in his words, agreement may be announced in about a month. So everything Joe says in this in this final segment uh, still apply. Today, in this segment, uh, it's going to feature Joe's opinions about the impact of resolving the trade war and why the race to 130 million bales between cotton production and consumption is so important to the industry. Very good, Jim. All right, so without further ado, here is Joe Nicosia of Louis Dreyfus Commodities. If we get a positive resolution to the trade war, they'll remove uncertainty, it'll increase optimism, it will increase the flow. Today the textile pipelines are thinner than they think because people are afraid to buy products because they don't know if they're going to get hit with a 25% tariff or not. That if we get a positive outcome, you're going to see Chinese consumption jump and jump dramatically very, very quickly. More good news for us if we make the deal. So where are we headed next? Prediction is difficult, especially if it's about the future. So, I'm going to play a little game with you again. I'm going to call it the race to 130. So what do we mean by the race to 130? The question is, is who gets to 130 first? Is it going to be production or consumption? 130 million bales. 
So when we look at them today, we've moved up to where we're all, both at about 125 to 126 million. Traditionally, in the last 10 to 8 years, we have never had production and consumption imbalance. We've either had huge surpluses or huge deficits, other than one year in the last 10. So this year's actually was predicted to be a little bit strange, where they're roughly imbalanced. So production numbers since 2012 have had a fairly uh, erratic production schedule. Consumption's been fairly smooth. Production's been going up and down. All those acres have been moving up and down. Today, the world fluctuated over 15.4 million acre range since 2010 and 11. So if we were to reach trend yields this year, production will go from the current estimate of about 126 million bales to over 131 million. Brazil's a good part of that. If you look here, these are our trend yields. Current estimates in the world today are that we're not going to have trend yields run low. Part of this is a little bit to do with the fact that acreage changes between Pakistan and India, which are lower producing areas. But the growth now in places like Brazil are high yielding areas. So there's the real question that maybe we'll get a substantial increase in world yield. And in fact, production will win that war at 130 million bales. But maybe not. Here's consumption. We've had a normal growth rate of about 3.2% over the last several years. This year, substantially lower because of the trade tensions that are there. So even though where we currently sit at 123 versus production of 118, we already start with a 5 million bale head start on the consumption side. It may seem like consumption gets to 131st, but we need positive trade resolution in order to get that done. And lingering trade disputes continue to hurt weakness around the globe. So, surplus or deficit goes to the winner. So why is the race to 130 important? Because it's going to set the global tone of whether we have a surplus or whether we have a deficit going forward in the year in front of us. So when we look at the world balance sheet to where we're at, we can see that the current estimates on the right-hand side for production is 126 and a half. We see consumption at 125.5. I'm sure you all have your own opinions on which one's going to win this race, but we'll see where it goes. And here's the ending stocks, and this is why the winner of the race is important. We felt all the down gold drums that we had for years with those huge stocks that were mostly in China, all the way through from the year, uh, from 2012 to 2017. But we've had a continuation of the drawdown, of positive outcomes as we've drawn those down until where we are now starting to flatten out. We need to bring those numbers down more still, so we're not quite ready yet for a production surplus over consumption, so the race to 130 is critical. So, all right, uh, finally, our one big thing this week. We'll bring you one big thing segment, and then we'll get you out of here. And uh, this week, we're focusing on... Uh, the USDA recently released their, it wasn't planting intentions, Jim, it was perspective the planting. Per, per, perspective plantings, there you go, mm -hmm. uh, their report that they came out with last week, and uh, lo and behold, it came in at 13.8 million cotton acres is what they're projecting, or at least what uh, growers have told them they will be planting uh, in 2019. Now, that's you know, uh, notably lower than a lot of projections and prognostications that came in, uh, but it's right on the nose with what Cotton Grower Magazine projected back in, way back on Janu the 1st of January, uh, when we released the results of our acreage survey. Our survey had been conducted uh, over the fourth quarter of 2018, between October and, and early December, and we came out with a projection of 13.7 million acres. Here we are three, four months later, and uh, they're still right on that number. So, uh, <laughs> excuse me while I toot my own horn. I was, I was, <laughs> you know, I was excited to see that. I mean, we put a lot of work into that thing. We do a lot of, we lean heavily on our uh, uh, grower, our readership, certainly, but also the extension community who we have befriended over the years are a big part of that. The association community who we've befriended over the years are a big part of that. So, yeah, I get excited when, when it looks like we're going to be right uh, as it comes out to 13.8 million cotton acres. Again, that's a reduction of what other folks may have been projecting, but it's also a robust number. I mean, it points to a good year for cotton. It, it points to a healthy industry. 
we got gins going in uh, in parts of the belt. Another, you know, uh, uh, sign that that things are good. Things are humming right along in the cotton industry right now. And I also think it's a it's a realistic look at at the numbers based on on some of the environmental issues that we had to deal with last year. And by environmental, I mean weather. Yeah. You know, with the the drought uh, eating up a lot of the acres in Texas, taking them out of the uh, taking them right out of uh, growing and harvest consideration. Uh, and hopefully some of those are going to be coming back in this year, which which it appears that way, but they will still be low. And then also the impact of, uh, of the hurricanes in the southeast and the damage over in those areas and uh, to some of the acres in Florida and Georgia and South Carolina. So um, based on that, I think the uh, the 13.8 million is is actually a very solid number. Probably probably going to be right on. I would I think so too. Um, you know. It, it, among those sort of more uh, natural or organic factors, weather is a very natural factor that's going to impact acreage from year to year. You know, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the elephant in the room, which is that trade dispute that's ongoing right now. Correct. Uh, prices are being hampered by that, you know, and so this number, this acreage projection number, if it comes in at 13.8 million, is not as robust as it could have been in this country this year. And, you know, for, uh, it's a sour note, but it's also, you know, the market does, did its job here. You know, if prices are hampered, then it's supposed to discourage uh, planting so that we don't have this glut of cotton that further hampers prices. So, you know, it's the market acting naturally and you growers responding in a natural and, you know, kind of responsible way. So, you um, uh, you can't overstate how uh, how much this trade dispute is impacting decisions as we get in true well and truly into planting season right now. We've covered this the topic extensively. In fact, you can read about it uh, in our April issue, which should be hitting your mailboxes right about now. And uh, you know, again, it just can't be overstated. Whether or not Trump is able to get a respectable deal done with the Chinese will make all the difference on prices and acreage all the way up into, you know, May, you know, p- people are still still making choices. So uh, the drawback in projected acreage already had a little impact on the market. Jim's mentioned it. Uh, the bulls have made a little headway on on prices in the in the market. And, uh, you know, there, there are people out there who are projecting 80 cent prices, even as we are in this limbo with no deal. I mean, prices are kind of inching northward. And that's great news. We certainly love to see that. We hope the market rewards all of our listeners out there. So, uh, you know, Jim, did you, I don't know if you had any further th- thoughts. I know you were looking at things kind of regionally. No, I mean, when you, when you take this, uh, this, this plantings report and break it down on a regional basis, I think you see the numbers are not unexpected and really kind of mirror a lot of what we've heard in all of these projections with uh, the Southeast uh, projected overall uh, USDA says they're going to be down 2.6% from, from last year, and I think that's that's fair. Yeah. Uh, in the Mid South, uh, the projections are looking at uh, 2.3 million acres across those five states, and that's a 14% increase. Again, not unexpected. That that sort of backs up some of the comments and, and discussions we've had earlier uh, this year. In the Southwest, uh, they're looking at 8.2 million acres, which is down about a half million acres from 2018. Uh, and over in the Western states. They're looking at upland acres uh, projected to decline pretty evenly across the region, while the uh, the Pima and the ELS acres are expected to climb 2.4 percent. So, uh, again, I think the considering the market conditions and uh, and and certainly everything after the after 2018, uh, if we can hit uh, 13.8 million acres. Overall, I think we'll be in good shape. Yes, yeah, so again, that's a net positive. It's very healthy. It's a it's a good number. It's a great number, honestly. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we were planting south of uh, nine million acres. Gosh, right. what year was that? Uh, wasn't <laughs> I should know this? I mean, but it's been within the past six seven years. I remember twenty eleven was a tough one. Uh, maybe that one that I'm thinking of, where we were like eight point eight million on the whole. So again, a good year. It's been it's going to be a good year in twenty nineteen for all of us. So. Uh, We're going to hold up there. We're going to take a minute to hear a brief sponsor message, and then we'll be back to get you out of here. Cotton farmers are learning that the Enlist Weed Control System boils their toughest weeds. 
Those who've planted Phytogen Cottonseed with the Enlist trait are able to use either Enlist 1 or Enlist Duo herbicide post-emergence to clean up difficult weeds. When used as part of a program approach, including a burn down and residual herbicides, Enlist herbicides can help cotton farmers keep fields clean all season long. Plus, both herbicides contain 2,4-D choline. This form of 2,4-D features inherently low volatility to stay on target after application. In addition, starting this year, soybean farmers will be able to plant Enlist E3 soybeans commercially. They'll get the same excellent weed control benefits of Enlist herbicides in high-quality, high-yielding soybean varieties. So whether you're planting cotton or soybeans or both, take advantage of the exceptional weed control and on-target benefits of Enlist herbicides. Learn more at Enlist.com. So all right, that's going to just about do it for this installment of the Cotton Companion podcast. Uh, we want to thank one final time Mr. Joe Nicosia for allowing us to use his speech here on the podcast. Uh, again, we know if you're listening to this podcast, you know all about Joe Nicosia. He's a respected industry voice and uh, we are pleased that he allowed us to use his speech on this platform. So, once again, I want to thank Enlist for sponsoring us, and we thank you, dear listener, uh, for joining us. If you like what you're hearing, by all means, tell your farmer buddies about this podcast. Y'all are our greatest marketers, our greatest evangelizers. You can tell them to get to us uh, in three easy ways. The first, simply go to cottongrower.com forward slash companion, and uh, you, you... Type that in. It will bring you to a landing page that hosts each of our 45 now, I believe, episodes of the Cotton Companion Podcast. Second way, subscribe to our channel on iTunes. And finally, the third way to find us, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, the Cotton Grower e-newsletter. And you can do that by going to the www.cottongrower.com forward slash subscribe page. That's forward slash subscribe. And uh, it's very intuitive from there. It'll take you to... Sign up for not only the podcast, uh, or rather the e-newsletter, maybe the magazine if you're currently not getting that. Go ahead and do it. Also, finally, make sure you're following us on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter, and on Facebook you can find us. You all know how to do that. Simply search for Cotton Grower Magazine on Facebook. So, we hope you're enjoying our latest issue, which is going to be the April issue, I'm going to say, by the time this gets to you. Again, this is the second week of April right now, so it should be hitting your mailbox any day. And uh, finally, this podcast is produced by the great Tyler Hatch, who works at the Mothership Meister Media Worldwide in beautiful Willoughby, Ohio. My name is Beck Barnes, and I'll be back with you two weeks from now for the next episode of The Cotton Companion. For now, on behalf of my own cotton companion, Jim Stebman, we wish you all the best. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cotton Companion. Visit Enlist.com to learn more about the Enlist weed control system and to hear from farmers experiencing the technology.